Maya turned her back on her friends and entered the AR booth. She only got a few feet into it before she heard Jackson and Noelle rush in behind her. This is cool! Jackson circled the chair, then bent over and examined it. There's a processor under here. He gestured at the glass that surrounded him. The glass will be the display that adds to what you can see through the dome now. He reached down and picked up a woven looking headband that had been lying, almost hidden, on the chair's seat. This looks like a sensory device. See? He held up the headband and indicated a lattice work of nodes on the inside of it. I think this will augment your senses to make your experience feel real in every way. I think the way it works is whatever, Maya said. She darted to the chair and grabbed the headband. If security had seen them enter the AR booth, she didn't have much time. She took a seat. Maya slipped on the headband. She looked around. Nothing had changed. How do you turn it on? Maya asked. Jackson bent down. He fiddled with something. Suddenly, the glass walls of the AR booth disappeared. Maya could see directly out to the huge expanse of the pizzaplex, and it was filled with birthday balloons, streamers, and piles and piles of birthday presents. It was also filled with hundreds of people blowing noisemakers and cheering. It was as if everyone in the pizzaplex had stopped to focus on Maya. All the adults and kids on the walkways were turned to look at her. All the people in the dining room were gazing her way, their glasses raised. The rides were still in motion, but all the people on them were craning their necks to see Maya as they zipped past or spun around. Patrons and employees alike were smiling toward Maya as if she was the most important person on the planet. Surprise! They all shouted in unison. Maya felt a thrill of importance as she gazed out at the crowd. Then she teared up again when she spotted her family. They were all there. Her parents and Elena, her aunt Sophia and uncle Raphael, her aunt Luciana and uncle Peter. She saw all her cousins, even her favourite, little Axel. She saw her neighbours. The Davis twins were jumping up and down and waving at Maya and the Thompsons, three kids, held a big happy birthday banner. Even old Mr. and Mrs. Lambert, the grumpy couple who lived across from the street from Maya's home, were in the crowd. Mrs. Lambert held a, a plate of her award-winning coffee cake, grand prize winner at the county fair for 20 years straight, dear. Maya's love of that coffee cake was what had endeared her to the otherwise curmudgeonly couple. <laughs> uh, Maya saw her favourite teacher, Mrs. Carpenter, and her minister, Pastor Ben. She saw all the members of her choir and her classmates from school. Everyone was wearing party hats and everyone looked like Maya's birthday was the happiest day of their lives. Happiest day, wink wink. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as Maya strained to try and pick out all the people she knew, the crowd parted and Glamrock Chica, her bright pink dress shining under the bright lights, skipped into view, heading toward Maya. She pushed a big cart. The cart held the massive six-tiered birthday cakes frosted in creamy icing and decorated with red candy roses, Maya's favourite flower. Sixteen huge candles flickered atop the cake. Maya realised she was... Wait, sixteen? Sixteen! Just like how many balloons there are in Happiest Day! Oh my gosh. And how many candles there are in uh, Princess Quest, but we don't talk about that. Anyway. Maya realised she was smiling so widely that her cheeks were starting to hurt, but she smiled even wider when Freddie's band started a boisterous rock version of Happy Birthday and everyone started singing along. Maya reached out and grabbed Jackson's and Noelle's hands. See? Wasn't offline after all. Happy Birthday, Maya! Noelle hugged Maya, then stepped back so Jackson could follow suit. Maya smiled at the cherry scent of Noelle's shampoo and the smell of Jackson's pizza breath. She understood that the scene in front of her wasn't real. The pizzaplex couldn't have suddenly transformed into the birthday party of her dreams. All the people she knew didn't just beam in magically, and the ones she didn't know, of course, weren't interrupting their fun to make such a big deal of a total stranger. But it felt real, and the familiar smells of her friends anchored her to what was really real. The combination of real and not real was heady. It spun Maya out of herself and into the fantasy of frolic and laughter, at first, it felt like Maya was just watching the celebration around her, but as it continued, she was no longer an observer. She was drawn into the party just as she would have been if it was real. After Freddie's band finished the happy birthday, everyone started chanting, Make a wish! Make a wish! 
Maya grinned and imagined having this, la this moment last forever. Then she blew out the candles. Their smoke spiralled upward as everyone cheered. Maya laughed in delight. Freddie's band started playing one of Maya's favourite rock songs. Jackson grabbed Maya's hand and he spun her into the crowd, which backed up and formed a circle around a makeshift dance floor in the centre of the walkway. Jackson and Maya weren't a couple. She thought of him more as a brother than a friend, but the two of them had always danced well together. <clears throat> Sorry. Jackson had some serious moves, <laughs> and Maya was naturally graceful. As they started popping to the staccato beat of the song, they slid into a series of intricate steps that they'd never practiced but had had and, but had to have looked choreographed to their audience. Maya felt like a dancing queen as Jackson whirled her and dipped her and even flipped her over his shoulder. When the song ended, the crowd went wild and more couples filled the open space as a new song began. They danced and danced and danced. Maya didn't know how much time had passed when Jackson, sweaty and grinning like a maniac, led her through the crowd to the cake. There, Glamrock Chica handed Maya a gleaming knife which might have looked scary in any other setting, and Maya cut into the second tier of her gorgeous cake. She got the first piece, and she nearly fainted in bliss when her teeth sank into the most <clears throat> into the moist pistachio and buttercream flavoured confection, her favourite flavours. Mm. Several employees rushed out to help hand out cake. They all hugged or high-fived Maya as they passed her. She didn't know any of them, but they all acted like they had been long-time friends. The music was still blasting and the crowd was still laughing and dancing and chattering. Maya felt a little like a bouncing beach ball as she passed from one group of revelers to the next. She was hugged over and over and over. She received kisses and pats and love yous from all her relatives. Her favourite kiss was from sweet little Axel. The lip smack was wet and sticky from the smear of frosting on his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Time continued to expand and compress in an odd and disorienting way as Maya suddenly found herself seated near the massive pile of brightly wrapped presents. Her mum, after whispering that Maya's special present from her grandparents would come later as usual, began handing Maya the presents, and she opened them one by one. Most of the presents were wrapped in floral-themed paper. Everyone knew how much she loved flowers. All the gifts inside the festive packages were things she loved. She received vibrantly coloured clothes, stacks of romance novels and books on gardening, sheet music and CDs of her favourite music, makeup and jewellery, stuffed teddy bears, posters and prints of flowers and cute kittens, scented lotions and soaps and candles, a portable keyboard, a new guitar and finally a new laptop and a camera. These were to help her photograph and catalogue the flowers she grew, her mum said. The gift opening seemed endless. It seemed endless to me, that sentence. <laughs> Maya actually started feeling guilty. She was sure that watching her open presents had to be boring for everyone else. Whenever she looked up at the people surrounding her, though, they appeared to be enjoying themselves. They were totally attentive. Maya couldn't imagine a more perfect birthday celebration. She wanted it to last forever. Hmm. Maya, Jackson and Noel ducked under the tape and looked out at the boisterous groups of kids and families enjoying the pizza plex. I can't believe this looked like my birthday party a few seconds ago, Maya said. I told you it would be great, Jackson beamed as he designed the AR unit himself. As if he designed the AR unit himself, sorry. Maya leaned into him. Yes, you did. And you were right. I can't believe we didn't get thrown out of there, Noel said, looking up at the security booth. Maya followed Noel's gaze. She frowned. Noel had a point. Surely they had cameras in the AR unit. Someone must have seen them. Maya shrugged. Whatever. I'm just glad I got my big party. Now can we go on the roller coaster? Jackson asked. Maya laughed. Yes, let's go on the roller coaster. The friends linked arms again and they headed for the roller coaster line. As they made their way through the crush of happy people, Maya felt like she was more floating than walking. Her virtual, or augmented or whatever, birthday party was the best birthday celebration she'd ever had. It wasn't that she didn't appreciate the birthday picnics her family usually organised for her. The potluck affairs that were always held in their yard and always included a basic sheep cake and cheap piñata. But she'd wanted the kind of party she'd just had in the AR unit. Now she'd had one. She was a happy girl. I admit that this coaster is flashy looking, Noel said as they queued up for the ride. But I don't see how a three-story roller coaster can be much fun. It won't get high enough. She gazed up at the roller coaster's apex. It's not the height that makes it thrilling, Jackson said. It's the speed, and the loop-de-loops, and the other things. 
One of the things, Mayor asked. You'll see, Jackson said in ominous tones. Mwahahaha. <laughs> Noelle rolled her eyes. You can't be that scary, but it was. Mayo and her friends didn't have to wait long before they were the next ones in line for one of the yellow and red striped cars coming toward the continually moving loading area. The cars were big enough for three people, as if they didn't mind a tight fit. So Mayo and Noel followed Jackson to one of the cars. They pulled the safety bars tightly over their chests as instructed, and as soon as the bars clicked into place, the car disappeared into a dark tunnel. Rock and roll, are right. <laughs> Wait. Oh my god, they actually used the Monty line? That's brilliant. Rock and roll, right? Jackson shouted as he reached for the touchpad in front of them. The pad, wait. Wait, wait. Yellow and red, oh, never mind. I thought it was yellow and green. It would have been like a Monty themed ride. Anyway, rock and roll, right? Jackson shouted as he reached for the touchpad in front of them. The pad was the only thing lit up in the blackness. Always, Noel yelled. Throbbing bass notes ushered in a screeching guitar riff and the car picked up speed. As it accelerated into a turn, a giant pirate fox suddenly loomed in front of them. Raising a gleaming hook, the fox swiped the sharp steel at their heads, just as the car jerked to the left. Mayer and Noel screamed. Jackson whooped. The car swung around in a tight loop, then shot upward and flipped over, whipping them upside down into another U-turn before suddenly flipping them back over and climbing. From that point on, the ride was a blur for Mayer. Every few seconds, it seemed like another Freddy's character, lit up blindingly and larger than life, appeared out of nowhere and scared them silly. After the third jump scare of the shark, sh I thought it said shark animatronic, I was like, Felix? After the third jump scare of sharp animatronic teeth speeding toward her face, Mayer closed her eyes. From that point, the ride was a mayhem of motion and sound and light flashing behind her eyelids. Thankfully, it was over seemingly as fast as it started. When the car slowed, the safety bars released and Jackson jumped out of the car. Noel clambered after them. After him, sorry. Maya brought up the rear, staggering. She was sure the ride had stolen some of her bones. Her legs felt like jellyfish tentacles. Wasn't that the boss? Jackson shouted as he grabbed Maya's and Noel's hands. Let's go get our videos. He pulled them toward the little kiosk near the Count, uh, the, near the coaster's exit area. A couple minutes later, they had their custom videos. Maya wasn't sure she'd even look at hers. She didn't need to watch a close-eyed version of herself being terrified at a hundred miles per hour, or however fast they've been going. Jackson had kept yelling out the speeds during the ride, but Maya had, ig but Maya had ignored them. Now what? Jackson asked. Maya shook her head. Your choice, Jax. She'd come here tonight for the AR birthday party, and she'd gotten that. She didn't really care what they did now. It was after ten when Maya pushed open the back door to her family's small bright kitchen. She hung her keys on a peg by the turquoise retro fridge. Her parents, as she'd expected them to be, were sitting at the multicoloured tile-topped table, sipping hot chocolate and playing a game of cards. It was their sometimes pre-bedtime routine, and Maya suspected it was a good excuse for them to wait up for their teenage daughter to get home. Maya's mum drew a card and smiled up at Maya. Have fun, sweetie. Maya grinned. It was great, even better than Jackson said it would be. You wouldn't believe everything they have there. The... Maya stopped. She'd been about to tell them about the uh, AR unit, but to do that, she'd have to tell them about the dream party with everything she'd ever wanted in a birthday party. She didn't want them to think she didn't appreciate the parties they had for her. Oh, and also sneaking behind security tape. <laughs> Did you go on the roller coaster? Maya's dad asked. I read about it. I bet it's pretty cool. Maya laughed. You sound like Jackson. You couldn't stop talking about it. Maya held out the videotape she got at the kiosk. Here's a video of our ride. You can see me screaming and closing my eyes as tight as I could get them closed. Maya's mother shook her head. Oh, that sounds like fun. Uh... Her words were dripping in sarcasm. Maya went to her mum and gave her a hug. Laying her cheek against the top of her mum's head, she closed her eyes to soak in the smooth softness of her mum's short black curls, peppered with grey. Her mum smelled like jasmine, as always. Maya straightened, then stepped around the table and bent over to give her dad a quick hug. The top of his head wasn't soft. He kept his thinning hair in a buzz cut, which felt like a big burr against Maya's chin. 
But she didn't care. She loved her dad and the way he almost he always smelled like ink and toner. Maya let go of her dad and turned to the gas stove. Like the fridge, it too was turquoise and styled to look like a holdover from the 50s. She knew there'd be enough hot chocolate for her left in the pan. She poured it into a mug and joined her parents at the table. She took a sip of the rich chocolate. Deal me in next round? Absolutely, her dad said. Maya smiled as she watched her, fa her parents finish out their hand. For the thousandth time, she thought about how lucky she was to have such great parents. Her mom, dark and petite and pretty, was a grade school teacher, but she always had plenty of time to take care of her family. Maya's dad, his plain face creased with smile lines around his eyes and mouth, ran an office supply and print shop. He worked long hours, but he somehow always made Maya and Elena feel like they were the centre of his world. He spent time with them every day. As her parents finished their hand, and her dad dealt out the cards for a new hand, Maya thought again about the AR unit party. She wasn't sure why it had been so important to have that experience of being the focus of everyone's attention. It wasn't like she was neglected. Maybe it was that her parents were so laid back that nothing had ever felt like a huge deal. Sometimes Maya wanted things to be, to be exciting instead of just happy. Maya picked up her cards. For now though, breathing in the aroma of the chocolate in the mug in front of her and gazing at her parents' content faces, she was okay with happy. After a half hour or so of cards, Maya kissed her parents, said goodnight, and headed down the narrow hallway to the bathroom. She took her time in the hall, pausing to gaze at the dozens of framed family photographs that covered the walls. Of course the photos had been there for years, but the party had reminded Maya of all of the people who loved her. She wanted to linger over their images for a few seconds before brushing her teeth. When Maya finally got to her room, she didn't even bother to change into pyjamas. She was suddenly wiped out. She just fell back onto her twin bed. She hit the mattress with such a big whomp that the bed frame scooted along the wood floor. Elena sat, in the, sat up in the other twin bed stuffed into the small room. Wah! In the muted yellow glow of a domed nightlight, Maya could see Elena's face was crumpled and her curly black hair was in a tangle. Sorry, El, Maya said. It's just me. Time is it? Oh, <laughs> what time is it? Elena rubbed her big brown eyes, ones that looked just like Maya's. Late, Maya hopped off her bed and moved to Elena's bed. Scoot over. Elena grumbled, but she scooted. Maya cuddled in next to her sister and wrapped her in a hug. Maya savoured the soft warmth of her sister's flannel-clad shoulders as she looked around their small bedroom. Containing just the two beds and one nightstand along with one dresser and a table that served as a desk for both of them, the room had been Maya and Elena's domain for their whole lives. Maya remembered when the, when the room had been painted pink and the bedspreads had been white and frilly. Now half the room was painted Maya's favourite colour, red, and half the room was painted grey. Maya's bedspread had a rose design, Elena's was pale blue. That sounds like a horribly coloured room, but uh, whatever, I won't judge, I haven't seen it. Maya thought about all the presents she'd received at her big birthday party. She smiled. It was a good thing they hadn't been real. How would you uh, have fit all that stuff into this tiny room? Too bad the AR couldn't have conjured up a big house for her and her family. But that was just silly. Maya loved this compact house. It was filled with happy memories. How could a new big house compete with that? What's going on? Elena asked. Maya laughed. It's my birthday, that's what. Elena squinted at the glowing blue numbers on their clock radio, which sat on their shared nightstand. Not for another 42 minutes and 15 seconds. Maya laughed again and squeezed her precise sister. Close enough. Besides, I already had my big party. Elena frowned. But I wasn't there. Yes, you were. Everyone was. It was the best party ever. Elena wrinkled her broad nose and made a face at Maya. She wriggled free of Maya's embrace. You're weird. You're weird. Elena rolled her eyes and flopped back onto the bed. Get out of my bed. I need my brain sleep. Maya smiled. Maya's mother was always telling her girls they needed their beauty sleep, but cerebral and not concerned with beauty, Elena took issue with that. She said she got big brain sleep that helped her be smarter. I, I don't know why I said big brain when there's no big here, but that works too. Whereas Maya had gotten looks, Elena had gotten brains. Elena might have been shorter and plainer than Maya, but what she lacked in beauty, she made up for in smarts and confidence. Elena was a year behind Maya in age. She was years ahead of Maya in education and accomplishments. 
Maya was content to be a teenager. Elena was in a hurry to be an adult. She was a math whiz and the following year she was going to be enrolled in the local college. Maya wasn't envious at all about Elena's brilliance. In fact, Maya was super proud of Eleanor. Uh, uh, Eleanor, yeah, sure, Eleanor, Elena. Maya was content to be Maya and she had celebrated Elena's Elena-ness. It had been, however, incredibly nice to be the centre of attention at the, at the Peterplex birthday party. Maya didn't usually get to shine like that. It was an experience she was never going to forget. The next day, Maya's family threw her the usual birthday party on the porch and grass in front of their house. Because the home's front yard was small, the party always spilled into the street and into the neighbouring yards. Even though decorations were minimal, the giant oaks and weeping willows that sheltered the small houses in the neighbourhood provided all the beauty Maya could have asked for. Maya's birthday was in May. Apparently inspiration for her name. Oh, that's the worst way to go. Um... Oh, yes, okay, so it must be May uh, instead of my, uh, because May, anyway. Uh, and it was always warm out this time of year. As usual, iridescent hummingbirds and fluttering yellow monarch butterflies were flitting around in the flower beds at the base of the porch rails in front of Maya's house. They were better than balloons. This year, besides the customary simple uh, happy birthday banner strung across the front of the house, the decor also included a sweet 16 sign Maya's youngest cousins had made. The big cardboard sign was lettered with crayons and decorated with glitter and childlike drawings of red roses. The piñata was, was the usual vaguely shaped horse form, Maya didn't even like horses, and the cake was a big flat chocolate one with a slanted happy birthday Maya written in store-bought tubed icing. The celebration couldn't have been more different than the one at the pizza plex. The only similarity was the presence of all of Maya's family and friends and Mrs. Lambert's offering of her award-winning coffee cake. The cake was usually welcome. Oh, sorry, the cake was actually welcome. Maya preferred the apple and crumb-topped cake to the chocolate one her family always had for her. Thanks for coming, Mr. and Mrs. Lambert, Maya said when she went to sit with them. They had bought their own folding chairs and had set themselves up under the gnarly oak under the street. They watched the party as if it was a war instead of a celebration, deep frowns etched between their brows. Hmm, Mr. Lambert said predictably. I hope you enjoyed my award-winning coffee cake, Mrs. Lambert said. It was delicious, as always, Maya told her. She wanted to hug the old lady, but Mrs. Lambert's erect uh, posture and stiff shoulders were as good as a keep-away sign. <coughs> Apologies. <coughs> Maya left the Lamberts and headed back toward the porch. As she crossed the yard, she rubbed her temples. This morning when she'd gotten up, her forehead had hurt, right where a couple of the AR headband nodes had touched her skin. She had figured the headband had just irritated her skin, but the pain felt more like a mild headache now. Oh no, it's going to be like in the flesh, isn't it? <laughs> She's going to produce something from her brain. That would be a cool concept for the story, like... She used to be about beauty, but now she's about brains because she had something on her brain. Anyway, hey, birthday girl, Noelle called out. Maya forgot about her headache and joined her friend. After the birthday cake had been cut, Maya and the other kids and teens took turns swatting the piñata. As always, the Davis twins, toe-headed Wesley and Wendy, singing in unison, were the ones who cracked the paper mache open. Or papier mache. Uh... Then they fought each other for the first grab at the candy. Everyone else hung back. The tall and gangly 13-year-olds' competitions were infamous. This was best not to get in their way. Although this party did have a small table of gifts, the present opening wasn't a focal point of the affair. Maya's mum always emphasised that gifts were optional. Presence is much more important than presents, her invitations always said. She knew that people in Maya's neighbourhood and at her school weren't well off. The custom at Maya's uh, family's parties was for the birthday celebrant to open a present here and there if the person giving the gift wanted to see it opened. Yeah, we do that. As usual, the most eager of Maya's gift givers were the Thompson kids. Donnie, 10, Parker, 6, and Aurora, 5, were Maya's three favourite kids, after her cousins, of course. She was their frequent babysitter because their parents, still pretty young because they had married when they were 18 and had Donnie a few months later, hadn't yet grown out of their need to party. They weren't clubbing regularly. They were great parents though, and Mrs. Thompson 
was an awesome baker. Maya loved lingering in the Thompson's pristine kitchen after the couple got back from their dates. Snickerdoodle time, Mr. Thompson would say, and Maya and the Thompsons would each, each eat one of the big soft cookies while Mr. Thompson told jokes. His favourite jokes were typical dad humour. Knock knock. Mr. Thompson had said a few nights before, oh no, what is this going to be? Maya had answered dutifully, who's there? Alpaca. Alpaca who? Alpaca the luggage. Yeah, Alpaca the car. That was actually awful. <laughs> Maya and Mrs. Thompson had groaned in unison. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Mr. Thompson always managed to make Maya laugh several times as he walked her home. The cookies and the jokes were great, but the couple paid Maya well too. For the last three years, since they'd moved in a few houses down from Maya's home, the Thompson kids had made Maya birthday presents. The first year, they gave her bookmarks made from tongue depressors, Mrs. Thompson was a nurse, and crayon and glitter decorated brown lunch bags that looked like they'd already been used. Last year, she'd gotten a necklace made out of pipe cleaners. This year, the kids had all gone out. They'd made her a scrapbook constructed from more brown lunch bags and filled with glued on buttons, string, and photos of three kids. This is wonderful, Maya gushed when they insisted she open her present. I picked out the buttons, pug-nosed Aurora announced. She beamed with pride, and her brothers snorted. Well, you did a great job. I appreciate all the effort you put into it, Maya told them. The kids accepted her thank you hugs and scampered off to see if Wesley and Wendy had left any candy behind. Maya appreciated everything about her party, and she had a great time playing with her cousins, especially little Axel, Aunt Sophia, or Aunt Sophia and Uncle Peter's youngest. Axel was a pudgy-faced four-year-old with dark, dark eyes and a grin that never disappeared. Maya loved babysitting him. He was obsessed with patty cake, and they played it so long that Maya's palms were sore when Axel finally got drowsy enough to curl up in her lap and go to sleep. When Aunt Sophia, her long braids looped on top of her head in an intricate knot, picked up her youngest son, she kissed Maya on the forehead. Feliz cumpleaños, mi sobrina. Thanks, Aunt, Aunt Sophia. <clears throat> Maya grinned when Sophia raised an eyebrow. I mean, gracias, tío. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, gracias, tía Sophia. Uh, Maya's grandparents had come to the US before they had their children, Sophia, Luciano, and Maya's mother, Violetta or Violetta, uh, they'd learned English right away and they made sure their three girls were bilingual from the start. The same was true of their grandchildren. Between them, Maya's mother and aunts had given Maya's maternal grandparents 12 grandchildren. Sophia and Peter were responsible for six of those. Do we care about any of this, seriously? <laughs> it's stalling for time. Come on, get to the good part. Uh, Luciana and Raphael had four kids. Maya's mother brought up the rear with her two girls. Recently, Sophia had become obsessed with celebrating the family's Puerto Rican heritage and she was taking Spanish lessons. She was insistent that Maya learn too. Maya humoured her with the occasional phrase. Thankfully, Maya's dad's parents weren't as interested in their ancestors' roots. Mostly, we're Irish, but I think we have some Czech, some Greek and some Welsh in us. Maya's father had told her when she'd asked about it. She was glad no one was obsessed with that heritage. She couldn't even imagine trying to learn Gaelic or even more difficult Czechoslovakian. She was also glad that her father was an only child. Not that she didn't love her cousins, she did, but family get-togethers were chaotic enough without even more little kids running around. After Maya's aunts and uncles and cousins left, Maya and her parents settled in with Maya's grandparents around a small bonfire in the backyard. It was the family's tradition that the grandparents gave their grandchild a special birthday present after the party was over. Maya always loved this part of her birthday, just as she loved her grandparents. Maya's two sets of grandparents couldn't have been more different. Her mother's parents were dark skinned, short and round, their faces lined from years of smiling, their hands caloused, caloused or something from years of working. They ran a construction business. Under construction! Uh, in their early 60s, they could both wield a hammer as well as any of their younger employees. Even Maya's gran could drive a nail in with just two strokes. Maya's father's parents, on the other hand, were tall, pale and soft-looking. Self a self-professed aging hippies, Nana and Puppy, were artists, and the only thing their hands revealed were the colours of the paint they were using their latest creations. They looked younger than their 60-some years, and they sounded even younger than that. So you're 16, Mayor, Pappy said, right, uh, Pappy said now. Right on, he patted her knee. 
You may have noticed that age spots were joining the freckles on the back of Pappy's hands. Pappy reflected the Irish part of her dad's family background. Whereas her, whereas her dad had black hair, Pappy's hair was deep or burn. Because this is a special year, sweetie, Nana said, we all chipped in together to get you something, well, special. It's going to be like a CD or something. She looked at her husband and her gran and gramps. Isn't that right? Gran nodded. She pulled a small vel red velvet pouch from her pocket of her gingham apron, which she hadn't removed even though she'd left the kitchen hours before. She held it out and Maya took it. Maya pulled at the pouch's string and she turned the pouch over. A thin gold chain with a delicate gold rose pendant fell from the pouch. Hold up. Why is there so much emphasis on roses? I want to know. I, I want to know if there's... Like, you guys can look this up or theorize about it in the comments, but... I want to know if there's like a a symbolic meaning behind using roses in a story. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It didn't really explain what Maya's connection with roses is. So that's interesting to think about. <clears throat> oh, Maya gasped. It's beautiful. Nana elbowed Pappy. I told you she'd love it. Oh, wait, no, that's Nanny. Never mind. Pappy shrugged. He winked at Maya. I voted for one of those video game contraptions. I thought someone your age would want something more techy. Maya shook her head. I've had techy already, Pappy. She smiled widely as she thought about her virtual birthday party from the night before. This is perfect. Elena helped Maya put the necklace on, then hugged her sister. Happy birthday, big sis. Maya's parents and grandparents hugged Maya in turn. When they were done... Uh, Maya's dad, Firelight, making the scalp showing through his thinning buzz cut, appeared to shine, got out his guitar. Maya and her parents and grandparents sang old folk songs for the next hour until Elena said her brain needed its sleep. When Maya settled under the covers that night, listening to Elena's snores, her sister always fell asleep in seconds, Maya pressed her fingers to her forehead. The slight headache that had nagged at her off and on all day was throbbing more insistently now. Was the pain related to her time in the AR booth? No, Maya thought. It was probably just a coincidence. She was simply overtired. Maya closed her eyes. It really had been a perfect, perfect birthday. She'd had her big party and her traditional party. All was well in her world. Maya closed her eyes and relaxed into sleep. When Maya looked back toward the end of everything, she couldn't easily pinpoint when it all started to go weirdly wrong. She remembered the first shock, of course, but at the time... But at the time, it didn't seem all that strange. Sad, yes, but not strange. After all, it wasn't unusual for 62-year-old year, uh, 62 year old women to get breast cancer. And it wasn't unusual for them to lose their battle with the disease, even after weeks of chemotherapy and radiation. So yeah, uh, I do just have to say this before we get into it. It is going to be touching on cancer. So that's just a warning. Uh... Uh, yeah, we'll talk about this at the end, because uh, this is like an issue that I have with the story, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Besides Gran's cancer diagnosis, nothing out of the ordinary happened in the year following Maya's 16th birthday. So yeah, we're a year after now. Things were pretty normal, except for Maya's recurring headaches. The headaches, though, annoying, had never been serious enough for her to tell anyone about them. Secretly, she wondered if the AR booth's headband had done some kind of nerve damage. However, since the booth had been closed when she'd used it, she didn't think she had any right to complain to anyone about it. Besides, the pain was low grade and intermittent. She told herself it was nothing. Maya's 17th birthday was nothing like her 16th. Although Gran tried to insist that the party go on as usual, no one was in the mood to celebrate anything. By the night before Maya's birthday, Gran was like a transparent copy of her old self, as if someone with shaky hands had tried to transfer her likeness into flimsy tracing paper. On the night of Maya's 17th birthday, Maya wasn't sitting around a bonfire with her parents, sister and grandparents. Instead, she and Gramps, Maya's parents, her sister, her aunts and uncles and her cousins cluttered around Gran's bed in Gran and Gramps' living room. Gran had insisted on passing away at home so they turned the previously cosy and comfy room into a sick room. It was a room barely large enough to contain all of the people who'd come to say goodbye to the wasted women in the narrow bed. And it was a room not nearly big enough to contain all the love the family had for this woman who was close to taking her last breath. The room was also inadequate to hold the grief that was born and grew to its full stature the second Gran was gone. 
Later, as Maya and Elena clung to each other in Elena's bed, Maya asked, Why Gran? Why not mean old Mr. Vance from down the street? I saw him kick his dog once. He's a jerk. Why not him? Elena hugged Maya tighter. Doesn't work like that. There isn't some good and some bad list like Santa has. It's biology and chemistry and DNA and... And BS. It's BS, Elena. It's just... Maya burst into tears. She touched the gold rose that hung from her neck. Oh my god, I, I was about to let out a tear there. That's, that's a heartbreaking line. Jesus. Uh, she hadn't taken off the special necklace since she'd put it on. She held it right now, as if by holding on to it, she could hold on to her gran. Oh my god, I'm actually going to cry. <laughs> Why am I going to cry to this? <clears throat> when Maya finally crawled into her own bed and tried to settle in to sleep later that night, she wasn't relaxed at all. All was not well in her world. she just lost one of her favourite people on the planet. What would be next? The a- <laughs> Let me restart that. The answer to Maya's question came within just a few days. Pappy was diagnosed with cancer next. It was in his brain and it was growing fast. He was unable to care for himself within a month of getting his diagnosis. Maya and her extended family took turns doing everything for Pappy. And before Pappy reached the end, Gramps got his diagnosis. He's not going to fight it, Maya's mother said to Maya's dad the day they got the news. Maya and her parents were at the dinner table, picking up plates of spaghetti. No one had an appetite. Maya's mother, though, was stoic. Uh, her eyes felt dry. Maya, on the other hand, felt like she was drowning in tears. She had trouble breathing, too. It was as if a big troll had settled on her chest and was squeezing the air out of her. Why was this happening to her family? As Maya got ready for bed that night, Elena sat in front of the computer they shared. If it was just Gran and Gramps, Elena said, tapping a few keys, I'd suspect something carcinogenic in their building supplies. But it's Pappy too. Maybe his paints? Maya looked over her sister's shoulder. As Elena clicked the mouse, the display shifted from an article to the world's page under construction. Elena, oh sorry, to the words page under construction. Elena sighed dramatically. <laughs> yeah, I like this a lot. This is great. It's a great touch. I'm going to bed, Maya said. Elena said, mm, and clicked the mouse to open a, few, a new search window. For the next several nights, Elena stayed up late, researching the causes of cancer. Maya wasn't good at research, so she spent her spare time reading to her grandfathers. Pappy, of course, didn't understand her anymore, but she knew he was aware of her presence. Gramps kept telling her she should stop wasting her time catering to a dying old fart. You should be out on a date, he told her several times. Maya tried to remember the last time she'd cared about going on a date. Just a few months before, she'd had a crush on the junior varsity quarterback. Now, when she looked at his carefree grin and his trussled hair, or tousled hair or whatever, she just felt annoyed. Wrapped up as she was with her sick grandparents, Maya didn't pay any attention to what was going on with anyone else. It was only after Nana got cancer and died, just days after Gramps and Pappy were gone, that Maya emerged from her grief fog enough to notice that people all around her were getting the dreaded disease. Mr. and Mrs. Lambert succumbed not long after Maya's grandparents passed. Maya didn't even know they'd been sick until their grown children showed up to close up and sell the house. Maya felt bad when she found out. She hadn't been over to see them since Gran had gotten sick. Weirdly, she vaguely wondered what would become of Mrs. Lambert's award-winning coffee cake recipe. This is horrible. Uh, this obviously isn't how cancer works in real life, and this is also why I kind of wish they didn't use can Like, this is my main problem with it. I wish they didn't use cancer. I wish they used, like, Faz disease or something. <laughs> um, although that would have just been comedic. But, like... Cancer is non-communicable, it can't be passed on, it doesn't really work like this. Um, I think it is actually genetic. I don't know, do your research, but, um, you know, this isn't necessarily how cancer works in the real world. So, it's still terrifying though, still very scary. But she didn't think about that for long. Mr. and Mrs. Davis were diagnosed next, then Mr. and Mrs. Thompson. Maya hadn't even noticed she hadn't asked to babysit for a while because she'd been so preoccupied with her grandparents. When she found out they were sick, she went to see the Thompsons, and she offered to help take care of them and the kids. She did the same for the Davis family, running back and forth between the two homes and her own 
took up all her free time after school. At school, she was barely conscious. However, she was aware enough to notice that she was hearing the word cancer far more than she should have been. My brother was admitted to the oncology ward last night. Bryn, the varsity head cheerleader, said to her crew, oh, that was a woman, uh, as Maya shuffled past their table in the noisy cafeteria. We're taking care of my sister at home, Bryn's best friend, Mackenzie, said. The hospital said the oncology ward is full. Actually, there aren't any beds in the whole hospital. When people go to the ER, they park the beds in the hallway. Bryn had no response to that. The other girls at the table were equally unconcerned. Maya stopped and stared at them. They didn't notice her. Did you try that new mascara I told you about? Bryn asked one of the other girls. The girl, a pretty blonde, fluttered her eyelashes. Can't you tell? Everyone at the table admired the girl's long lashes. Maya shook her head and took her tray over to the table where Jackson and Noel were already seated. Maya flopped into a plastic chair and slammed her tray on the scarred, laminate-topped table. She gestured toward the cheerleader's table. Can you believe them? They're acting like it's no big deal. Like what's no big deal? Noelle said. Maya frowned at her friend. All the cancer. Jackson shrugged. My mum was diagnosed last week. Maya's mouth dropped open. I'm so sorry, you didn't say anything. What's to say? Jackson asked. He dug into the chilli on his tray. The pungent scents of tomato and onion filled the air. You all want to go to the pizza plex this weekend? Apparently the new animatronics show is pretty incredible. Maya stared at Jackson. She shifted her gaze to Noel, who was nibbling at a salad. Noel was totally relaxed. <coughs> Apologies again. I'm coughing a lot because this is... I'm talking a lot. I've been talking a lot for like the past three days. Um, seriously? Maya said. The word came out high-pitched and too loud. Jackson and Noel frowned at Maya. Several kids at neighbouring tables turned and looked at Maya with raised eyebrows. Maya lowered her voice and leaned toward her friends. Why are you acting like everything's normal? Jackson and Noel exchanged a baffled look. Jackson gazed across the table at Maya. Um, because everything is normal? Maya slapped her hand on the table. The thwack cut through the chaotic conversations and the tinkling cutlery th sounds in the room. For a second, the sound so stopped and several heads rotated Maya's way. Maya ignored the scrutiny. She kept her voice low and steady when she spoke again. Haven't you noticed that it seems like everyone's getting cancer? My aunt Sophia was just diagnosed, my uncle Raphael was diagnosed a month ago, and my grandparents have all died of it in the last 13 months. It's weird. Something's going on. Jackson shrugged. Cancer sucks, for sure. But there's nothing weird about it. Maya opened her mouth to argue, but what was the point? She picked up her tray and stomped out of the cafeteria. She no longer wanted to hang around with her friends. They were clueless. She couldn't stand looking at their carefree faces. Over the next few weeks, Maya saw less and less of Jackson and Noelle. Summer arrived and her friends got jobs at the local burger joint. Maya didn't have time for a job. She split her time between the hospital where she'd sit with her aunts and uncles. Aunt Lucia and Uncle Peter had cancer now too. While they received chemo in her aunts and uncles houses where she would help take care of their older cousins, four of whom were now dying of cancer. She also still helped out the Davises and the Thompsons. Maya spent her days making food, changing sheets, emptying bedpans and do do doling, <laughs> doling out medications. She spent her nights tossing and turning and listening to Elena snore. When Maya's grandparents had gotten sick, Elena had been a com com compatriot in Maya's needs for answers. But Elena had long since stopped going to the library. When Maya would ask her why so many people were dying of cancer, Elena would just shrug and stick her nose back in her latest math te textbook. Maya sometimes thought of trying to figure out what was going on herself. Although she didn't like doing research, she knew how. But when did she have the time? She was too busy taking care of sick people. One afternoon in, one afternoon, sorry, in late August, just days from the start of Maya's senior year, Maya finally got a bit of good news. Her favourite teacher, Mrs Carpenter, had her first baby. Noelle stopped by to tell Maya about it. The two girls stood in front of the washer and dryer in Maya's house. Maya's father had been sick for a month. Because her mum was focused on caring for him, Maya was now doing everything else in the house. The cooking, the cleaning, the shopping, the laundry, even paying the bills. She wasn't sure how much longer she'd be able to do that. Her dad's chemo treatment was making him really weak. How long would we be able to keep working? How'd you hear? 
Maya asked as she and Noelle folded a sheet. My mum is in the hospice ward at the hospital. When I get bored sitting in with her, uh, I go to the nursery to look at the babies. Uh, Maya wanted to call Noelle out on the offhand way she talked about her mother's condition, but she also wanted to wanted more to focus on something hopeful for a change. A new baby was hopeful. Is she still in the hospital? Maya asked. Mrs. Carpenter, that is. No Noelle shook her head. I think she and the baby went home. Noelle's eyes lit up. Do you want to go see them? Maya nodded. She didn't. She doesn't live too far out from here. Let's ride our bikes. It took only 15 minutes for Maya and no Noelle to pedal the few blocks to Mrs. Carpenter's house. They reached the small cottage-style home just as the summer storm cloud released a downpour and thunder rumbled across the sky. They dropped their bikes in the narrow driveway and scurried to the covered front porch. When they knocked, lightning lit up the sky behind them. Thunder sounded again just seconds later as Mrs. Carpenter opened her door. Girls, what a nice surprise. Mrs. Carpenter wasn't a whole lot older than Maya and Noelle. She'd started teaching in Maya's sophomore year. She was a tall, slender woman with wavy brown hair and bright green eyes. She could easily have passed for a teenager, even now standing in her entryway holding a blanketed bundle to her shoulder. Maya craned her neck to get a glimpse of the child. Congratulations, Maya said. We came to see your baby. Maya held out a bunch of roses she picked from her backyard right before she and Noelle had hopped onto their bikes. With everything that was going on, Maya hadn't had time to tend her flowers, but they seemed to be taking care of themselves. The peach-coloured blooms in Maya's hand were healthy and fragrant. As she held out the flowers, it suddenly occurred to Maya that they should have bought something for the baby. Oh, I'm sorry, Maya blurted. We should have bought a toy or something for her. Her or him? Mrs. Carpenter backed up and motioned for the girls to come into her house. They stepped into a cramped but tidy living room. It was bright with white walls and yellow upholstered furniture. The room smelled like lemon furniture polish, and the whole house smelled like a fresh brewed coffee. This surprised Maya. She'd been in her aunt's and uncle's homes after each of her youngest cousins had been born. Their houses has always smelled like a mixture, mixture of dirty diapers and talc and spit up and sweet milk. It was what Maya thought of as baby smell, a distinctive scent that seemed to come with infants. Her, Mrs. Carpenter said. I've named her Cecilia. Cecilia. She stopped in front of a small stone fireplace. Would you like to hold her? Sure. Maya accepted the bundle Mrs. Carpenter offered her. Putting the baby close to her chest, Maya inhaled and smelled nothing. She took another sniff. Nope, not a single thing. That was weird. Maya shifted the baby, carefully cradling the baby's head with one hand. While the other hand... Oh, sorry, with the other hand. Maya pushed back the blanket that swathed... Sw sway, swathed... <laughs> what is this word? She, Maya pushed back the blanket that covered the infant's face. Maya gasped, and she almost dropped Mrs. Carpenter's baby. Mrs. Carpenter's baby?! Maya gazed in horror at the thing she was holding. It was all she could do not to thrust it back at Mr. Mrs. Carpenter and run screaming from the house. Swallowing hard, aware of sweat trickling down her spine, Maya looked up at Mrs. Carpenter. Mrs. Carpenter beamed at Maya, then looked with, with pride and joy at her new daughter.